Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Benjamin Nyland. I'm here with Jasper and we want to talk about um, deploying teams. Now what? It, it, essentially, um, when we thought about this webinar, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Why? Well, we've seen many, many webinars, ourselves including, um, on how to set up stuff. So how to set up teams, what are the, the configurations, what is the how, how certain things work what is a list what are columns how do they all work how do they connect to a channel and it doesn't mean we're not going to talk about these things in this webinar but we really wanted to bring insights from the field what are customers doing what are being what is being deployed what are people saying what's happening um, how are other microsoft teams running right now and that's why i uh, contacted my good friend here so I'll let Jasper, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm trying to click next on the slide. Uh, so right. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so my name is, uh, is Jasper Oosterveld. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from the Netherlands in Amsterdam, and I work, I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, just like Ben. And I'm also a modern workplace consultant for a Dutch company called InSpark. And in that role, I support customers implementing Microsoft Teams. It's no surprise. Uh, with a focus around governance, adoption, and also compliance. So, and yeah, in that capacity, I'm here to uh, <laughs> to uh, answer some questions, have a good chat. I'm very excited. Well, thanks, thanks again for joining, Jasper. Jasper and I have uh, been connected for quite a long time, so you might hopefully we won't be doing too many inside jokes that nobody will understand. Um, and I'll keep my my Dutch language to broches met kaas which means bread with cheese, which is the only thing I asked for uh, when I got to the Netherlands. But again, uh, we wanted to talk about teams, but most importantly, we wanted to talk about um, insights, customers, both at ShareGate. So obviously, as you know, I work at ShareGate. I want to talk to you and share with you what we've seen using telemetry usage uh, in, in some words uh, through customer research as well. What are the behaviors that we're seeing? And then Jasper brings in the consultant view from InSpark and uh, what's happening there on the field live with customers. So again, thanks for joining. I see some of you have been somehow joined directly into the live event into the lobby. Uh, it's possible that it's uh, simply a uh, hyperlink issue. Um, there's an attendee link and there the goodness of teams, right? Uh, but don't you worry, it should be fine as long as you can hear us. This is and uh, recorded and will be available as well. Um, for those of you that uh, we have the Q&A in Microsoft Teams, if you want to continue the conversation, so Jasper and I thought, hey, we'll do this hashtag. So if you're on Twitter and you use SG Teams Talk, not only will we be looking at it right now and be picking off questions during this webinar, but also afterwards, I'll continue to look into this hashtag. Um, and if we can answer and help you in the long run, I'll continue to be looking at this hashtag um, and try and help as much as we can. Um, I didn't tell Jasper this in advance, but hey, this is what we'll be doing. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's get started. You got teams under control, question mark, right? The, have you or have we? And the agenda here, we wanted to talk about, uh, we broke it down into four major categories. So first we're gonna talk about everything related to provisioning. So we're gonna be talking about what our customers doing with the creation process. So for those of you not familiar with provisioning, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit, but we'll talk about, you know, essentially it's the creation and the automation of creation uh, as a process for teams for everything that gets connected with it. We'll then dive into security. From, we'll try and reach as much as we can from uh, MFA, but we'll also talk about sharing and settings. Um, we'll then jump into customizations. Are our customers doing custom PowerShell scripts or web parts? How are they, they doing? What, do they do them only in the context of provisioning? Is there other contexts where this is valuable? And if so, what do they do? Uh, and lastly, we'll talk about architecture. Um, is it everything on the one hub site? Do you do multiple hub sites? What do customers do? Do they do it by division? Do they do it by department? Um, and we'll talk about groups. You know, how do they work? How do you organize channels, no channels? There's so many topics. I don't even know if I'll have time to cover everything and everything within Microsoft Teams. Uh, and I like to say Microsoft Teams, capital T, because Microsoft Teams is not just Microsoft Teams, it's SharePoint, it's Planner, it's all these things. But of course, we'll be focused on the Teams aspect of all of this. Um, so yeah, the goal today is really get behind the scenes look at how others have been doing it. So let's just jump right in. Jasper, 
Um, I think we both wanted to talk about provisioning as one of the first topics because if I'm not mistaken, you told me this is one of the number one things when you go see customers, it's uh, a high on the list. So let's let's kind of talk about that. Of course, it falls <laughs> under the category of governance, uh, new cr users creating new teams every day. And, and us at ShareGate, we see it with telemetry. I think we saw like a 25 to 30% increase in, in groups and teams being connected in the last year. Now we know things have changed in the workplace, uh, but we wanted to talk specifically about provisioning. So I'll let you dive into first these these notions. Yeah, yeah of course, thank you. Yeah, so um, so what we do these days for the customers is that we, uh, we, we do a lot of governance workshops. So we basically define how Microsoft Teams is being used within the organization. And one part of that is provisioning. So provisioning is, is basically like an app that automates the creation process, often through an approval for a team. And that team can be a department or a project or a process or an expert team, it doesn't really matter, but it's more a controlled way of creating teams. Uh, instead of just opening teams, clicking on uh, create new team and giving it a name and then and then basically you're, you're done. A lot of organizations um, don't wanna start with that because they worry for uh, like a team sprawl. Because yeah, what what you in theory can have is that you have a lot of duplication of teams. You know, I you know I create a team for marketing. You don't know it exists. You create another one before you know it. We have like five marketing teams. So with this governance workshop, we basically discuss you know how do you want to use teams for what kind of collaboration purpose. So they often say department, project, et cetera, et cetera, and then eventually it leads to this like request and creation process of teams. So I'm, I'm a huge I'm still a lot of, how do you say it? I'm, I'm really pro self-service, uh, but unfortunately for most organizations, that's just a little bit too much and too advanced in the beginning. What so, does that mean, self-service? Um, like, what do you what do you understand by that? So we're on the yeah, same page. Yeah, self-service, it's, it's a little bit, it, it, it can kind of blend in with provisioning because basically provisioning is also a, a sort of self-service because you open a form and you fill in some details and then a team is created. It's a, it's a form of self-service, but what we mean by it is that I as a an, as an business user open a Teams application and just create a team without any, without any interference by a form or any governance rules. So that's kind of what we see as self-service. Okay, so if I understand pro, pro, essentially you have self-service, people will be able to create whatever they want whenever they want. And exactly. then the provisioning process aims uh, to control that creation so that there's sort of an, I, I, I hear with or without approval or automate, automatically create the team based on certain things. So um, I'll get to the next slide, but I think one of the biggest questions that people have is what, it, what essentially do you, do you create and why? I know you have a, a Visio as well, um, but what essentially we wanted to first talk about the advantages of provisioning versus not having it. And, I know, I think I saw in one of your stats that um, that you'll share at Inspark that it's quite high in the list of consulting work creating these provisioning processes. Us, I can tell you at ShareGate, what we've seen is we've seen an increase in 21.5% in just a few months, really in terms of the creation of, of groups. And we'll talk about groups later. Essentially, it means teams for the most part. So we're seeing a huge increase of people creating teams, but at the same time, um, so we also noticed quite a bit of inactive teams eventually happening. So that grew just as well. So people are creating quite a bit, um, but sometimes they're just leaving it. Uh, maybe it's duplicate, as you say, and they discover it later. So I wanted to, to, to talk with you about what are the advantages of provisioning and why why are customers putting in before we talk about what actually they put in place and what does that look like but what are the advantages yeah you can you see a couple here on the slide and what we mainly notice is that uh, we define these governance requirements per collaboration templates or per team uh, per department project expert team and then what we notice is that with provisioning it's a lot easier to enforce those uh, requirements um, there, a good thing, though, is that Microsoft is putting a lot of effort in Teams templates right? that's, that's been released, I believe, last year or beginning of the year. And so you have some abilities to create your own templates and there are some ways to create an approval process, but it's not really there yet. It's a little bit in the, begin in the, in the beginning phase. 
So what we notice is that if we apply an, an, an provisioning solution, so we have our own based on the PNP uh, platform. There is also, of course, other parties that, that sell those uh, kind of products as well. But we just noticed that it's a lot easier now to enforce those governance requirements, for example, a naming convention. Um, by using Power Apps, you can create a very user-friendly form where you can add your own introduction text, you can give explanation per template. Um, uh, people basically only have to fill in a couple of details like name, co-owner, uh, maybe do you want to have guest access? So like in a couple of clicks, they basically can request and a team will be created for them. So it's a lot more user friendly, mm -hmm. whereby the Teams application itself, you know, what well, you and me get it, like we create a yeah. new team, but then it says from scratch or from Microsoft 365 group. And then most people are lost, like they don't know what the difference yeah. is. So that's something you can prevent by using provisioning. Um, yeah, and in those forms, you can include your corporate branding and, 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 and uh, yeah, you just have a little bit, you just have more control basically. And for most organizations, that's just especially important in the beginning. Um, because yeah, what you show in the graph as well, there's a lot of more groups slash teams being created. Not necessarily a bad thing, it's, you know, it's not necessarily bad, but what you said, there's a lot of inactive, inactive, inactive groups as well, and that can be a bit of a worry. So what I'm understanding is that provisioning doesn't necessarily mean blocking the creation. It's just trying to make sure that whatever is being created, you can also try and make it automatically create it, but you try and guide the right creation by making sure that the way they type the name of your teams, um, the right validations are in place or exactly. that if they're going to, they understand the concept of templates, even though the creation of a regular teams and out of the box is uh, from scratch or from something else type of thing. Is that, is that what, it, what you mean? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I think we've seen something similar. Actually, I don't know. Like we've talked about the advantages, but it also brings me, I was hesitating and switching slides right away because there's some great points here, but it's uh, for me, the challenges that to, uh, with provisioning that, that it introduces. So of course, there's some that you've put pretty out of the box. Um, I think one of my, my major one that I wanted to talk to you about and see how customers are actually implementing provisioning is the freedom for business users. And that's really the one I wanted to tackle before we talked about licensing or requires development expertise. As you say, Power Apps, not everyone knows how to create Power Apps and then connect it to Power Automate and or yeah. automatically create teams that may be a little bit uh, more complex. But let's say you have the expertise, you know how to build all of this. How do you put it in place at customers so that the provisioning becomes something that enhances the creation process, because I imagine what happens if somebody clicks on create team uh, out of the box, or do you block uh, everyone from using the out of the box features? But then are you worried? Like how, how do you make sure that you bring it to customers in a way that makes it easier to use overall? So can you share what maybe some examples that you have to yeah, customers and what, what it looks like? Yeah, so what, what we what we basically always do is if, if we use our own uh, provisioning solution, we basically include it in the app bar of Microsoft Teams. So then it, for example, uh, is called request team or new team. You can just give it any name you want. So then they already see it's on the left side, uh, but we do block the, the default creation method. Uh, so if you go down, I think it says show all teams or and you can create a new one. That's basically, if they want to create one, it's blocked. So you know, that that is a little bit of a less freedom for business users, but by offering it to the to, in, within the app bar, and of course also spending a lot of time on adoption and communication, people are aware that this is for now the way to request a project, for example. So that 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 it definitely helps uh, increasing the acceptance and uh, for the business users to so you, uh, replace, like, you added a new button inside the team's navigation yeah. so people could see it. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah. I was going to yeah. say, how do they know that there's a process and where to start it? And what also, happens if they're not in teams? What happens if they're in SharePoint? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one actually, because, because, we, because a, a lot of times we still do it through SharePoint uh, that you have your SharePoint portal where you can request, uh, a, a, you know, like a, a project, for example, just keep using that. Um, but we do now see the switch moving more towards teams and that's why we offer that app on the left side and then the organization itself, they communicate, uh, within the organization that this is not a way forward. Um, but it, yeah, in theory, you can do it through both. You can do it in SharePoint and Teams, but we kind of see it now, especially since COVID, is mainly switching towards Teams to do it within there. Okay, 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 interesting. 
So, and, and as part of the provisioning, what are the typical, do you mind if I open the Visio that you sent me earlier? Yeah, sure, sure. All right, so I'm gonna, and I'll hopefully, uh, I'm unable to close my PowerPoint, so there's gotta be a way, there we go. Um, so I opened up and I hope I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I hope that you're still able to, to see, apparently I'm not zooming in more than this. Um, <laughs> so you, you shared me the Visio here, and you, you kind of showed me the process between, like w when do you use this and how do you get yeah, a provisioning I, I process in place? Yeah, it, it looks very co complicated. And it's it's what I do, I created this basically for uh, my colleagues as well, um, because I, I'm not the only one who can do those workshops, because <laughs> otherwise, you know, there's not enough time for me to do that. So there were a lot of colleagues asking like, when do we pick provisioning or when do we just let users created through the Microsoft Teams application itself. Uh, so what I did, I basically set out all the governance requirements uh, for like an, an name a convention and uh, external access and basically created this model where you basically start with deciding, am I going to start using multiple templates? Like and, and with templates, I mean project, expert team, customer, whatever. And from there, you basically go to the left or to the right. And then every time it asks you a question, like, do you need a naming policy? No. OK, then you go here. Can people create it by themselves? And we'll share this slide uh, feature as well with the people who are attending. So no worries if, if you can't see it all. So it basically goes just to, to, through this decision process and that eventually leads up to uh, 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 yeah, uh, the decision how we're going to offer people the way to create new teams. And often that most of the times that leads to provisioning. Uh, but what I what I what I'm seeing that in the near future, I think we can move more towards the out of the box creation process by using Teams template in combination with sensitivity labels. And that's something we can touch upon in the security part. Um, okay. Because through that you can also enforce a lot of uh, governance requirements. So now there's a lot of provisioning, but I'm 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 think within a year, maybe two years, it will move more towards that direction. But this can help. This helps us, but it can also help people who are listening to make a decision. So I'm curious when you say that in a year or two, you might no longer need provisioning. What do you what do, what should customers do with people listening to the call right now? They're thinking I'm going to put a provisioning system in place or should I not? What should I do? Should I focus on Teams template? What, what do you recommend customers do right now? Yeah, of course, it depends on the requirements, but I think there's definitely no shame in starting with provisioning now. And then eventually when the, the company is more mature and Microsoft's own services are more up to date, there's no shame in phasing it out like that. You know, we've been doing that with other stuff for years as well. For example, workflows. Why right? we have years ago, we had to buy an Intex workflow. There's an example. There were more as well, but a lot of customers bought those licenses and often when uh, uh, flow show up, our automate showed up and that became more advanced. People started to phase that out as well. So, you know, that stuff just keeps developing. So there's no shame in doing it now because you can have the benefits now. And, and then later on, maybe you phase it out and use something else. I think that's inevitable okay. with IT in general. Yeah. Perfect. Makes sense. Um, I think when I think about it myself in terms of um, you know, all of these provisioning for a long time, I, I thought here, let me just make sure your screen is, um, there's so many questions at the same time, I'm gonna have to figure out how we can make sure that we cover. So for everyone who has questions, don't forget there's also on Twitter, Edgy Teams Talk, uh, so that if ever we don't have a chance to uh, take your questions today, we'll make sure to get back to it. And what I'll make sure is after each topic, we'll take a couple of moments to look at the questions for that topic, say provisioning. Um, so I, I saw some very good ones around archiving, some questions about, you know, Teams channels uh, and security. So we'll talk about that in the second uh, part. But I wanted to touch on provisioning because provisioning also for me is the end of life. So for you is obviously how you create your Microsoft Teams. And we talk about the flow. And you said that at customers, you go through this Visio and that's how you figure out what you build in the form. Or do you have a, I guess my first question is, do you have a standard form or standard three, four, five, uh, templates that you usually yeah. put in place, and if so, what yeah. what are they? Yeah, we basically have, so we have our own provisioning solution with standard templates. So and those templates are again like for a department, project, a customer. So we have those default templates, and we basically enhance those based on the requirements of a customer. So they're basically up and running very quickly. And uh, do your templates? automatically associated. We'll talk about architecture later on, but do you also automatically connect to a hub site, for example? 
We so the distinction we make is between a uh, public uh, and uh, a private. So what we see is public is often the in internet side of things. So that's basically a SharePoint communication side that you can also request uh, towards some provisioning if that's if that's if that's necessary. So and those are often those are basically always connected to a hub. What we don't see a lot yet is that the, the private part, so the, the collaboration between a group of people within a department, for example, those are not always connected to a hub because, um, yeah, most organizations just find them in teams anyway, and they don't really do it through the internet, internet portal. Uh, that said, we have some customers who do create a landing page on their internet. Uh, for departments and then when every department site has a little uh, a quick link or you know, picture that refers to that closed part. So but the, the, the hub connection, we don't see that a lot yet. At the Interesting. Moment. I'll definitely yeah. want to talk to you about that. I think we have a topic uh, related to SharePoint pages um, and that's coming up soon, actually. Um, but it's definitely something I want to talk to you about. So maybe we fast forward and we get to that conversation just right now. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> so like because internally, so I'll use our, our experiences internally, Microsoft Teams we know is connected to SharePoint and SharePoint is not only for files. It's not only the files tab inside of Microsoft Teams that we see and we store documents. Um, for me, pages is just as much content as it is a Word document, for example. So we have a heavy use of, um, of, of SharePoint pages within a team's team, if that makes sense. So whether it's a, a page that the team created to um, uh, update on a project, definition of a project, whatever the case, and because all of our teams, so let's say we have the product department, which would maybe be a hub site, and then you have all the Microsoft teams that represent each um, product team for us, but it could be every smaller team in a department, say in the marketing team, so the SharePoint pages, you have the benefit of the rolling up of the pages automatically if you use them. So I was I was thinking, why do you make the choice of Teams um, not being linked to any of the hub whatsoever? From my understanding is, I, with your customers, you do Teams in a flat way, and then yeah, you have SharePoint yeah. communications um, in a structured way. Is that correct? That's correct. Not all of them, but most of them start like that, and then. You know, the, the, the nice the nice thing of Microsoft 365 is that eventually you can extend it. So let's say the organization has evolved more, is more mature, then you can say, okay, now we're also going to create a hub, for example, for these uh, uh, pro more private collaboration teams. Um, and the, 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 what you're saying is that within Teams, you can also use SharePoint pages, and that's something we do internally. So we have expert teams around certain topics. So I'm, for example, the owner of the compliance expert team. So I created a lot of SharePoint pages with uh, like uh, resource, uh, resources and like uh, intro, uh, more explanation around how things work. And I expose them through tabs and channels. And if you show it to customers, they all like it. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. But for a lot of customers who are basically starting now, they're still struggling with the whole concept of what, that Microsoft Teams and SharePoint are like, it's, it's now the same or is it different? Yeah. So the whole concept of working with files from SharePoint and Teams, that's already a huge step for them. So I think once they've mastered that, then the next phase could be like, hey, you can also work with pages and expose them within Teams. But yeah. most customers are not there yet. So you're just trying to get people creating the right Teams with the right settings at first with provisioning. And I, I'm, I, see, I see a question from the corner of my eye, so I'm actually going to take it from, uh, from, from Jenny. Uh, Jenny says, third-party apps are not uh, an option for my business. So my only option seems to be self-service. Is this right? What would you say? Um, well, it, 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 it kind of, yeah, if with third-party apps, I then think about the App Store that comes with Microsoft Teams. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of depends your definition of a third-party app. If a third-party app is also something like a provisioning app you acquire or buy licenses from from a third party, if you see that as, as, as a third party app, yeah, then, then you basically have to look at the Teams templates uh, and, and the options you have there. And then maybe yeah. in combination with sensitivity labels, if that's the only thing you're allowed to do. Yeah, so uh, and to answer to, ta to tag on to that, Jenny, yeah, third party is really a third party. So a, a vendor that you buy a third party tool. If you have the expertise internally or you hire a company like InSpark that does consulting, whomever, 
you can actually customize your own solution. So you can build something with uh, Jasper earlier mentioned uh, um, Power Apps. So Power Apps is one of the products that comes with Microsoft 365 to to create the form. There's a way for you to customize Microsoft Teams so that it becomes an app, so that it's available straight from the navigation. So there are ways for you to not go full blown self service if you need to have a sort of guidance to the creation yourself. So you you could build it yourself, but it is more work and often um, comes back to developing uh, a solution. Um, and the other, the other question I think we, we started uh, on it a little bit is when a team is created, it generates a new team entry in the GAL of Outlook. So GAL means uh, the global address list for those not familiar with it. Can this feature be turned off, prevent duplicates from being created or uh, direct to an individual personal contact list in Outlook? So basically, I think the question is, with so many people, even with provisioning, you have people creating Microsoft Teams, and Microsoft Teams automatically creates an email address. What has been your experience, you Jasper, with customers regarding this? How do you, I know it's been, a, I get it quite a bit of time as well with customers that are like, yeah, this is the problem with my exchange team is that it creates an email. So how have you seen customers address this challenge? Yeah, that, that, that's we hear that a lot as well, because what will happen is, let's say I create a team called marketing, uh, that and that will show up in the address list, and then people <laughs> start sending emails to that email address, but it just it, it, it lands somewhere, but nobody is seeing it because they're all chatting in Teams and they're not looking at the inbox that's connected to the team. So what we do, this is something we turn off through our provisioning solution as well. Um, I believe there's also a PowerShell script that you can turn it off for your tenant. Um, so that's something I I definitely recommend doing because it will create a lot of confusion. Yeah, so I, I, from our provisioning, we do it, but I believe there's a script where you can turn it off as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. If so it's not it's not so much tur turning it off, but it's more that you can. And as Jasper say, most of the time, it's through the provisioning that you put in place. So depending on the reason the person is is creating teams, right? The, they're creating a teams. They're going through a form. Depending on the choice they make, you can choose to allow the email address to go into the global address list or you choose you could choose not to so it's actually a powershell command line i usually have it uh, it's in my other slides i'll try to make it available in the slides for when they're available for download after the session but essentially there's a powershell command line where you can say which groups are going to be uh, hidden from the global address list uh, again as jasper says most of the time it'll go through the provisioning because sometimes you want this um, but it happens that if you create a team called marketing, well, automatically there's an email address, marketing at the company.com, and people may think that this is the email address of that team, but they might not be looking at the, the emails that are attached to that Microsoft Teams. So Excellent. yes, yeah. it's quite complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and we talk a lot about provisioning, but we do have a lot, still a lot of customers who have self-service and then they uh, they already, for example, are in a migration process with us and are using ShareCat Desktop. And now you can also use ShareCat Apricot. And I'm not saying this because we're in this in this in this session, but it really is it's the truth. <laughs> but they also use Apricot, and they really like how that helps them also have maintaining some control over the teams that are created. So we're talking a lot about provisioning, but it doesn't mean everybody do does it, and you have to do it as well. It just yeah. it really depends on your requirements and the uh, IT mature um, maturity of your organization. Yeah, I think, I, and I'm thinking I, I, from a product standpoint, I can look into uh, in Apricot providing that option to remove from the global address list with a with a small click. So I'll I'll look into that. I want to talk about uh, what is the customer experience at Inspark uh, regarding provisioning. So you had a few points. I'll let you uh, go over them a little bit. Yeah, we basically already discussed this. So so what we see is that majority of our customers is using provisioning uh, as a starting point. Um, and what I said, we have our own solution, um, but if you have your own development team, this is something you can create and maintain as well. Um, again, yeah, this, and that visual kind of this, the, kind of explains when you pick what, basically depending on the on your governance uh, requirements and decisions. Yeah, so perfect. I think we, yeah, perfect. No, no, yeah, I agree. I think uh, <laughs> it's it's essentially often linked to the templates. And, yeah. I, I, and, and there's so many questions, but I think I saw one regarding the fact that you can no longer create your own templates easily in SharePoint. Um, and I think, and I'm saying SharePoint because it's often linked to your Teams and you have Teams templates as well, and you want to create your own Teams template. So in the admin center, 
you can actually create your own Teams template. It's it's limited somewhat, but you can choose how many channels there's going to be and what kind they're going to be. Uh, of course, you can push this a bit further and, and, and create your own using uh, the graph and, and custom code. But essentially, I think a, a good provisioning solution, and Jasper, you can you can tell me whether I'm, I'm right or wrong, obviously, but um, what, I, what I like seeing is the focus on the templates within Microsoft Teams and the templates. Um, they're not really, really called templates anymore in SharePoint. They're called kind of site designs, or you can leverage just site scripts. Essentially, it's a way to automate how the SharePoint site part of your Teams is going to look and behave. What document libraries are going to come by default? What page templates are going to come by default? How the navigation should be for this kind of Teams? Um, so I usually like to leverage both at the same time if possible. So if you create a provisioning uh, solution, you make sure that you understand the need of the customer as much as possible. You remove as any friction as so that they are not stuck behind an approval process at every left and right turn. And then you leverage the out of the box, not so much out of the box, but you leverage the templates uh, to create the solution so that it's scalable, repeatable, and more importantly, it's future proof. Jasper, what do you think about all yeah, that? Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, no, uh, okay. yeah, I agree. Yeah, nothing to uh, add. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So what, what are your recommendations? I think I put my my point of view on this point. Uh, what, what would be your recommendations tomorrow for anyone? Yeah, that's, uh, we, we kind of touch upon this as well. So I think most important is that you first talk to the business and ask what their requirements are around collaboration, uh, and then yeah, and then match those with with the governance uh, uh, possibilities of Microsoft 365. Also, really take an honest look at the IT maturity of your business users. Uh, how, of course, not everybody's the same, but let's say the majority does understand the concept, picks it up very quickly. That really helps as well right because then maybe you don't really need to go for a provisioning solution i always prefer self-service uh but yeah again i'm also realistic to customers like if it you know if it doesn't match yeah i'm not going to say like you have to do self-service like you know because <laughs> <laughs> they get no because it's their environment like i don't have to yeah. work with it so you know what i mean so I'm, I'm always honest with them uh and definitely take a look at those teams templates uh in definitely in combination with sensitivity labels uh because Sensitivity labels were always used and are still are for classifying uh, content, for example, this presentation or an email, and they now basically extended it to also classify teams or SharePoint sites. And through the classification, you can also apply certain governance uh, uh, rules, like you can turn off guest access, you can set the team to private instead of public. You can determine the sharing links and you can also determine what somebody can do without without an unmanaged device from the organization. So yeah. that's really powerful. And it, 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 I think that's something you could definitely maybe take benefit of instead of going for a provisioning solution. So that's what I said. I think in the near future, this will probably be the way forward. But again, I, yeah, you never know what will happen, but if they keep developing it and extending it, I think there will definitely be a good competition, so to speak, for provisioning. Yeah. Huh. I see two quick questions that I think are going to be relevant, and I'll, I'll take a moment to go over some, some more of the questions um, as we get to the next topic. Actually, it's a good moment to, to start looking at the questions. One of them was uh, from Carl, who wonders, uh, how can smaller companies access developer network and sources um, as the cost of custom software development is, is sometimes not within the realm of cost for, for these smaller companies? So. Personally, I'm not a developer, but I know that there's Microsoft PNP or patterns and practices, and within that, it's kind of a community. So it's it's managed by Microsoft, but it's not just Microsoft within it. However, they they do kind of look at it and make sure that whatever is being shared there um, is good and relevant. And I recommend checking it out. They have a couple of um, free uh, content in terms that that can be used on GitHub. So you could just download it. Uh, they have, um, I was going to say display templates, but they're, they're, they're not called display templates anymore, <laughs> but essentially uh, view conditional formatting and view options for your, for your list and for your libraries. Um, they have quite a bit of stuff. Jasper, you mentioned they had something for provisioning as well. Yeah, exactly. Because what you said, it's a, it's a pretty large community that that basically provides this open source solutions for uh, to help you with certain solutions for Microsoft 365. And one part of it is providing a provisioning solution. But yeah, like I'm, I don't know, I don't know how to do it either, like because I'm not a developer either. But you do need a developer or multiple 
who actually can create your own solution with that. So yeah, it, it, it is difficult because then you do need to make an investment to make sure somebody develops it for you. Yeah. If that's too expensive, then maybe I would advise to look at third party solutions that have it ready for you and then see how expensive that is. Uh, it's yeah, it's 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 it, I can understand it's not that easy to just get a provisioning solution or make it yourself. Um, if that's not realistic, then you really have just I advise to take a look at the team's templates in combination with the labels. Time is flying. I'll take one question that I see and then we'll uh, we'll continue. Um, so uh, Microsoft offers cloning an existing teams. Can you use this cloning option in a provisioning tool in Spark? I, it's in brackets, so I just added it, but I'm guessing uh, they're, they're asking the question to you, Jasper. Uh, well, we don't use that way of, of creating new teams, but that yeah, Teams does offer that out of the box that you can create a team based on an existing one. I, I never really used it with our customers. Uh, that doesn't mean it, it doesn't happen at all, but I've never really used it. And that's the, the provisioning solution does have like a template. It's basically an XML file. And in an XML file, it basically says how the, 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 the teams build up. So what are channels are there, what tabs, uh, what Ben also said, what kind of SharePoint site is there, are there actual library, additional libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah same. Uh, we don't see as much. We see, we know that it's there. We know people, some people use it, but most of the time, what we see is uh, a, a provisioning solution with custom creation of, of these objects within them. All right, I'll move on to security, uh, trying to figure out how to keep teams secure while still letting users do their jobs. And it's a mindset of self-service and the way that we're looking to, to talk about here is how can people <laughs> click to add text? I should remove that. Um, there's a ton of things. So from our perspective, when we talk, the first part of security is, um, is it the right people that are accessing the content? So I think it's Joe logging in. Is it really Joe? Um, so one of the first questions that we asked when we did our analysis is, have you enabled multi-factor authentication or MFA um, in your organization? And 86% and was a yes. If you haven't en en enabled uh, yet, I think both of our recommendations today is, go and enable that feature. For the first few days, you're kind of annoyed because there's an extra step sometimes, um, but it's it comes in very, very handy in your organization. Um, and the second question that we that we asked is, do you allow users to use their personal devices? And of course, uh, that makes uh, this no surprise there is more and more people are coming in with their own device. Um, so Jasper, you wanted to talk about quickly MFA and MDM? Yeah, so so I'm I'm not like a security consultant, but <laughs> I I agree with you. Like the the basis should be MFA. That should just be on by default because with that you really reduce the risk to data leaks to like uh, unauthorized people having access. So that really should be on, and definitely for external people. Um, that you maybe not have it on for internal people is one thing, but for external people you definitely have to turn it on. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see the statistics. That's relatively high. Um, and of course, the, the 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 devices like you know I work for an IT company, so it's always a little bit easier more to have to use your personal device. But it's it's just reality. It's 2021. People just don't want to use their iPhone, just check their mail, maybe use their SharePoint app, Teams app. Um, so that again, you need to have something in place um, to facilitate that and also make sure it's secure. So this yeah. again, there's a lot more on security, of there's course. But this a ton be the more, base, obviously, the base, yeah, device yeah. security and all that. What yeah. I wanted to talk about, um, which is more our area of expertise, is everything related to sharing and permissions. So I put a ton of stats here to kind of share with you what's going on right now with, with other customers. Um, so we can see the 67% do have external sharing and guest enabled uh, out, of, uh, out of the people that we asked. So it's still quite a bit used um, in, in terms of tenants. And then we see that there's different levels of uh, access. So users can share files, like the default setting, if you will, for guest users and what people use. And we see the more popular one is guests must sign in and provide verification code rather than just have like anonymous access or, or, or completely not being allowed. But what I wanted to talk to you, and I think I saw already quite a bit of few questions in the chat. So hopefully we can, we can talk about all of it uh, kind of at once, is what do you see at customers the best practice to provide, you know, there's the different layers. There's membership access. Uh, so who can be a member of the group? I think some of the questions people are asking is, can you be a member of the group in the team and not have access to specific parts? And sadly, the answer for now is is no. You Once you're part of the team as a member, you really have access to everything. 
there are ways to, to make it read only, let's say for SharePoint, but in terms of once you're a member, uh, you're a member. But I think Jasper could talk about also, you know, the concept of channels. There's different types of channels inside of Teams. So I wanted to talk to you, Jasper, about what do you see in terms of sharing, settings, organizing teams and channels for, for your customers so that the right people have access to the right things? What's the typical scenario that you see with your customers? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of questions. Let me see if I have an answer all of them. Um, so, uh, so again, from a, a provisioning point of view, you can basically determine who will be the owners of a team. Um, so what we see at basically all our customers is that people within a business have the role as owner. Um, that relieves IT because then IT doesn't have to, doesn't have the job to maintain all these hundreds of teams, for example, because this shouldn't be their job. It's it's the business people who should own that and take responsibility. And that's, some, that's something we uh, take care of through our adoption and change management strategy, where we create awareness. Uh, what is your what are your responsibilities as an owner? What can you do? Uh, what are some of the settings you're allowed to change? What are, uh, what are some actions you can take? Um, so th that's something we kind of do there within our adoption and change management. And then if we look at external external people, guest access, that's I think at least 90, 95% has to turn on because every organization, especially IT, they know if you turn it off, they'll find a different way. They'll start emailing, they'll use uh, other services like Box and Dropbox, perfectly fine services, nothing wrong with them, but as an organization, you wanna have uh, some control over the data that's being shared and stored. And then if it goes to other locations, you kind of lose that. Um, so that said, it doesn't mean that uh, external people can have access to all teams. So basically what we always advise and, and also take care of is that departments, that's only for internal use. So that's often turned off. So it's turned off that somebody can become a member, uh, sorry, that a guest can become a member of an internal team. That said, there are some exceptions, of course, because there can always be a document that you maybe want to share externally. So in that case, we allow, that's allowed. So the organization says you cannot invite a guest to the team, but it's fine to share a document. That's totally fine. And I think that that, that should work as well, it's because otherwise yeah. people will download it and move it to, to, to OneDrive. And I think what's important is to separate, and I, I see a question a bit related to it, um, but you know, what, what is your recommendation for level of security to share files with users outside of the organization? Uh, first thing is to really understand that there's a difference between guests and external sharing. It's two different things. Uh, a guest is almost like another user, just like your colleagues. It's, it's a new user that becomes a member of the team. And, and so now they really have access to everything, limited, but they still have access to everything. External sharing is a separate set of settings that you can have with guests, but you can also have independently. And as Jasper said, you can just share certain documents, just share the SharePoint document library, just share the SharePoint site and limit and control how they're going to come and have access to it. And there's a ton of settings that we don't really go over. Actually, I was, I was curious, Jasper, do you have any default settings such as the uh, expiration time on, on sharing links outside? What, do you put any of these things in place with customers usually? Uh, now, the, the basically default sharing link we use and see with other customers is the new and existing guests. That's the most popular one. Um, there are organizations who are more strict about who gets access uh, and then they turn to the existing guest. And that means that somebody has to request for an external person to be added so they can share a document with, with him or her. Uh, that's the, but the most common one is new and existing. Um, we don't really see a lot of usage around expiration, and, and, and I believe there's a little bit of a gap still between sharing stuff from OneDrive, where you have a little bit more options around that area, and then sharing it from in SharePoint. Um, I believe Microsoft is still working on that. But what I would like, in, in what I would like to have, is that for each document I share, that I can say. This is the, when it expires, uh, there may be an additional password. Uh, that, but again, that's not really available at the moment. Uh, yeah. I, I believe more in OneDrive, but that's something I would like to see in SharePoint as well. Um, but yeah, that, so that's basically what we see and use. Yeah. And how do you, do you leverage channels to structure permissions, if you will? Like what do you, if somebody's having a question around private channels, create separate SharePoint sites, 
which are invisible in the admin center channel owner might not be the team owner. Lots of people have had issues. What do you recommend? And the, the question above it, which I think ties in is, um, you know, oh no, sorry. But like, do you create channels, more channels within a team so that you can manage permissions of who has access to what within the channels so that you don't have too many teams or do you create many teams, but then there's the team sprawl effect and people kind of get lost in where they where they're going. Yeah. So what we do internally is that we have a, a team per customer. So let, let's say we have a new customer, a new team is created, and for each assignment or project, we create a channel. But what, what we also do now is that we create a private channel just for InSpark employees. So that means that we can just invite the, the customers who work with us on the project. They have access to the team, the public channels, but they cannot see that private channel where we have our own uh, discussions and where we store our draft documents. I think that's a good way to work with permissions in a team. And you can apply the same within departments. Let's say you have a department with a management team. You could just create a private channel for that, those group of people, and then they are allowed to do their own thing in there and the other members cannot access it. I think that's a nice way to work with permissions. Um, what Microsoft is also working on is, is something called shared channels. I think they announced it at, a while back. I think Jeff Tieper yeah, did. Yeah, a while back, yeah. Yeah, a while back, yeah. They're, they're still working on it. I, I think, uh, I have hope they release it this year. That, that will be a fantastic solution because what shared channels promise is that you can create a shared channel and then you can invite guests to it and, and other people without giving them access to the whole team because that's currently the downside so let's say you have a team i'm just saying 10 channels and you've been working with for two months and you're like oh i just want to invite pete but then you add him as a member and he has access to all these channels with all the documents and that's something you don't want so that's where shared channels will be the solution for that yeah uh, but yeah I, I would try to work with permissions like that with private channels and try to prevent to go into SharePoint and then uh, changing the permissions of a folder. Yeah, it will. It, you can do it, but it will, it will become messy and hard to manage. Yeah, I think the way forward is likely to try and organize it by channels. There are some, I think it, it's perfect because there was a question, there was a question around when is share channels uh, coming, if we have any insights. To be honest, I can't share too much um, because of NDAs, but it's it always feels like it's l l about to come out. What we see in, in terms of experience, so I'm, I'm guessing there's, there's obviously a large uh, architectural impact on this release from Microsoft's part, and they want to make sure that it works well and impacts security. Um, so hopefully it comes out this year. It, it feels like it will, but who knows? Um, yeah, yeah, never I'll know. let Microsoft answer that question. <laughs> But yes, and, and and one other question before we move on from 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 this slide is, what about the general channel? Is there a way for to stop people from posting into the general channel uh, that gets created automatically? Do you do you see that request often actually? Yeah, so I, I get that question sometimes. Then uh, people people ask, can we get rid of it? <laughs> can we delete it? Unfortunately, you can't. No, it's just it's it's there. <laughs> Or people want to rename it as well because there's some customers who create uh, multiple channels and they put in a one two three four but you can't rename currently you cannot rename the general channel i believe that's also coming that you'll be it's able to have more yeah i think they announced it in the message center i just don't know if it's also for the general channel but you no you cannot get rid of it no and you can't really control the settings of permissions no. of what who can post in it so no. um unfortunately that's the answer <laughs> Um, if you want to talk quickly, again, time flying, but you want to talk quickly about, um, you know, you talked about uh, sensitivity policies, quickly talk about information protection. What do you recommend? Because um, I know I know this is super powerful. I know I often tell customers to look into it, but I also realize that not that many people have actually been using it. What are What is your sense of it? And what do you mean by information protection and governance? Yeah, so th th these are two topics that are very up and coming. So a lot of more organizations are, are realizing they have to do something with it. Um, and what you said is this very <laughs> this is very deep topic. So you can basically do a whole session about this. But in, in the basis is that information protection is all around protecting your your <laughs> your data. For example, documents stored in SharePoint, emails. What you can do, you can classify it. So for example, you can say this email is highly confidential. 
And by assigning that label, a couple of settings are enforced. And one setting could be that only internal people are able to view the email or view the document. And it's very important because you have to realize that, yes, you have to invite people to become a member of a team. But basically, after that, they can do whatever they want, right? They can download yeah. the document, they can spread it around. And that's something you can prevent with the information protection. So we highly recommend, and I also recommend to everybody listening, to definitely look into that and start setting it up and, 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 and look, look into your own company. What are our, our sensitive documents and how are, can we protect them? And the second one is all around basically archiving. So make nah, not only archiving, it's basically two sides. So one side is uh, making sure certain type of documents or teams are preserved so people cannot delete them or they are automatically deleted after a certain amount of time. It, and that basically goes hand in hand with archiving. So again, that's a little bit too much to talk about now, uh, but yeah. a lot of customers want to archive their teams and the content. Um, and that's something information governance doesn't really offer. It's more decentralized. So we are now creating solutions for our customers that, that offers a centralized archive, basically a SharePoint site where people have an, an, uh, some like a little custom action in your team that moves the, the content to that archiving portal. Um, right, but again, yeah, and definitely. And, but the two topics are very important because you probably have to deal with industry regulations or uh, 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 government regulations. So look at those that apply for your organization and yeah. then see how you can include them in working with teams. So you yeah, don't get a see, plan, we, so we you see don't the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. That, as you can see with the respondents, is, and not many people do anything related to this, but it is a, a hot topic that I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the answer of yes is going to increase over time, hopefully, um, because there's quite a bit. Um, so I think we talked about what your majority of your customers do uh, at InSpark, or is there anything yeah, you want so to the, add? Yeah, the, yeah, the MFA, M, uh, MDM, that's all taken care of. That's majority has that. The compliance, so the information protection and, and governance, that's basically we're seeing more and more requests. Um, also, because there's a lot, of, I don't know how it's outside of the Netherlands, but in Netherlands there's more and more data leaks and it's, it's yeah. getting really bad, like really, really bad. Like <laughs> I believe lately there was like a leak of uh, addresses of politicians. Now that's, you can, we can all agree upon, you don't have to agree with the politicians, but you can agree upon that's not a good, good uh, development. Yeah. And that's stuff you can prevent by using, for example, information protection. So there's a lot of awareness and it's a hot topic and Microsoft is putting a lot of investments around that area. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, highly recommend looking into that and we get more and more requests. So yeah. That makes sense. Uh, whoops, I missed the Jasper's recommendations. Implement the security. Wow. Um, yeah. Implement the yeah, security. We talked about uh, this. Rec yeah. Huh? We talk, basically, we talked about this. Yeah, I talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> so there's last two topics. There's customizations and architecture. Uh, there's fairly quick topics at least customization because, um, and it's something that we, we talked about earlier, is that most of the customizations that we see, um, they're actually for the provisioning, right? So we yeah. kind of covered most of what people do in terms of customizations and, and customizations could be different options. So we know there's apps, so Microsoft apps, such as um, you know the ones available inside of uh, Microsoft Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, there's the App Store uh, as well that provides uh, third-party apps as well for you. And then of course, there's everything related to PowerShell. So the automation of things by scripting and uh, sometimes there are hidden settings as well. So what we saw, or and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Jasper talk about it as well, is that most of the time, um, almost all customizations, they're done during the provisioning. So the new template with the right uh, web parts and the right everything, the right theming, the right design. So a lot of that customization happens inside of the provisioning process. And then afterwards, I mean, aside from, um, you know, PowerShell scripts, sometimes some uh, some added internet solution. I don't know that I've seen so many customizations. You know, what about on your side? What do you see usually people create, um, whether it's new apps, but it could be PowerShell scripts. What do you see they create most of the time? Yeah, so like, like you said, most customization goes through the provisioning. Um, and that what we also recommend is, uh, especially in the beginning, to turning off that, that app store, so basically the third party apps, because it can be a bit overwhelming and you don't really have much control as, a, as, as an organization, IT department, what apps people are adding. 
Uh, that said, there are some organizations who are working for a long time with, with non-Microsoft solutions like Jira is one that's very similar to uh, what Microsoft offers. Then we advise, well, uh, make sure that app is available so people can use that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that, but that, that's mainly the customization we see. So it's the apps and then the stuff that happens in the provisioning process. Um, yeah, that's like a, we, I mean, there's a good question that's tied into it. Um, do you see anything? Because we talked a lot about provisioning, uh, putting governance during creation. Somebody's asking is like, okay, but I already have a few hundred teams created and none of that provisioning stuff uh, existed. So how do you make sure that you go back? How do you put these naming conventions in place? How do you deal with an environment and teams um, that's already kind of not gone out of control because there's always a way to manage it but what do you see people create is there any custom solutions that usually come into it what do you recommend in that sense yeah there are some ways to apply let's say you if when you're provisioning you enforce a certain template within uh, a sharepoint there are ways to apply the template to existing sites um, that is possible. I've seen that in the past, um, yeah. but the only thing that's re not really possible is the naming convention or it is in a certain uh, minor cap capacity. Uh, so that will be the challenge to do that. Um, it, it can be done, but it won't be 100%. Um, but then let's say you uh, people were allowed to create teams themselves and you go to provisioning uh, by the app, for example, in the, in the, in the app bar. Yeah, you can, you can do it, but please communicate why you're doing it and don't just turn it all the one off and that on because people will be very upset, rightfully so. So spend a lot of time around communication, explain to them why you're doing it, what the advantages are, what it means for them and make sure they you explain to them they can still create a team uh, so that, that will help as well. Yeah, yeah. so it, it can definitely matter. be done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but so yes, the answer is yes, you can go back and, and, and update for most of it. Some of it is through PowerShell, but sometimes you can throw it to the admin center, or if you created a, a new solution, you can usually go back and, and look up all of the groups or teams that already existed and apply the, the settings afterwards for the most part, including templates, because uh, templates often use something called site designs and they can be applied uh, afterwards as well. So obviously you have to be careful how it's going to impact the existing content, um, but you can usually apply templates even afterwards as well to make sure that it, it, it standardizes your environment as well. Jasper's recommendations in terms of customizations. Yeah, so I touched upon it a little bit, but I would definitely uh, always allow the Microsoft apps because they're, I think that's the basis for proper collaboration in Teams. So like you want people to add a OneNote, want people to add Planner, uh, SharePoint, for example, and uh, whatever, uh, I would definitely allow those uh, and then take a look at your internal, again, your internal procedures. Are people allowed to just add apps by themselves? And if that's not the case or you don't want that, just turn that off for now and then also evaluate what non-Microsoft non products are we using and do we want to offer those in Teams? If so, just make those available. Um, and again, yeah, you can also review the Microsoft Teams PowerShell commands. This is more IT related, of course, but let's say you are in IT and you want to automate more in combination with Teams. There are a lot of PowerShell commands. Uh, definitely review those and see if you can maybe, maybe automate some manual procedures by using PowerShell. And good point um, from Matt. Uh, earlier, we talked about the general channel and it's true. There is a setting inside of the channel settings where you can say only owners can post uh, to the channel if you want to manage the permissions of the channel. So thanks, Matt. Definitely thought on yeah. that. Yeah. Um, in terms of architecture, last topic, big topic nonetheless, but I find uh, more and more today feels a little bit more comfortable. And again, I'll stick around for questions and try and answer questions in the, in the Q&A. If not, make sure to go back to hashtag SG Teams Talk uh, on Twitter and I'll, I'll make sure to get back to those uh, later on. Um, there was this that you wanted to share today, um, a, a, an image from Nikki Chapel uh, on her blog, and I put the link down there on where Microsoft Teams, where is my data stored? Do you want to touch on this a little bit? Yeah, so that this is again a lot of questions from customers uh, and also from IT, of course, like, hey, Teams is very, yeah, you can do a lot with it, but where is actually all everything going? Where is all, all our data being stored? So uh, the, the Nikki did a great job uh, of uh, creating this, basically this infographic. So where you can actually see per team 
functionality, where what it is and where it's being stored. So yeah, de definitely take a look at a blog and, and you'll share the slides as well. But this can definitely answer some questions around where is my data being stored. Yeah, and it's important later when you're going to put settings, governance, uh, sensitivity policies, because you need to know what they've been applied to, right? So if you're if you're just thinking about, OK, I want to change the um, what happens to files that are being added to my standard channel. Um, well, you need to understand that you have to go look at SharePoint and then you'll look at sensitivity policies for SharePoint to apply to these things. Conversation will be somewhere else. If you know one on one or group chat, you're not looking at SharePoint, you're looking at OneDrive. So it's all invisible to the end users, but there are. Uh, it's very important to understand where things are stored so you can manage them correctly. And we spend a lot of time always in the settings, you know, in the in the the the, the, the compliance center, really, where all of these things are, so that we can change these for the right group. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about Microsoft 365 groups? I think we always talk about it in every session. Um, Jasper, I'll let you go over this a little bit. Yeah, maybe it's good if he can go to the slide with the uh, with the infographic. I think yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so again, th this is this question has been going on for years. Uh, it used to be an Office 365 group. Now it's been renamed to Microsoft 365 group. Um, and I always try to explain uh, customers what it is, so they kind of understand also the impact for their environment and organization. Uh, so basically, the, the the foundation is Azure AD. That's basically where all the accounts are being stored of all your employees. So that's what you see in the right side. So you see user. So that can be, for example, uh, John Doe. But what you can also do is is basically bundle those people. I know it's proper English, but <laughs> put all those people together in a group. Traditionally, we had security groups or distribution groups, but since the introduction of Teams, you'd basically use a Microsoft 365 group. So it's nothing more than a type of group. And in that group, you connect people. That's, they will show it in the next slide. But through that Azure AD, you can basically make sure people have access to Microsoft 365, for example, for OneDrive or SharePoint. The, the advantage of a Microsoft 365 group is that you have a centralized membership. So for example, 10 people are in a team. That means there are 10 people in that group. And by doing so, they have access to all these connected services. So whereby in the past, you had basically separate containers. You had SharePoint, uh, you had uh, something, you know, you had Exchange, and you had a couple of ones, but they weren't really yeah. connected with each other. So that's the advantage of, of Microsoft 365 groups, a centralized membership to all these connected services. And all of this is stored in, as he said, Active Directory. So yeah. if you want to manage the list of people and how they're being managed inside of Teams, you're actually thinking to, you have to go to Active Directory and see the group behind the Microsoft Teams. Who are the owners? How do you want to manage that? And there's access reviews that you can put in place. There's there's a ton of features that most of the time people don't realize that it's not actually in Teams, it's not actually in SharePoint, it's actually in Active Directory, uh, even expiration policies, that's, that's where all of this is. And then of course, we have from the Teams perspective, so most of the time we'll see Teams become more and more the hub for everything. What did you want to talk about when you put this slide together, Jasper? Yeah, so basically, the, the previous slides basically under the, described the foundation, and now you can basically see uh, what happens if you create a team. So on one hand, you get that group in Azure AD where all the members are being managed, and on the left side, you can basically see that they get access to a, a variety of services. So that basically means that from an IT point of view, you need to realize that you need to manage multiple objects. Yeah, you need to manage that, that group, uh, but you also need to manage the team side that comes with it or the, the group and stream or the plan and planner, for example. And for the business uh, users, they also need to know how to work with all these multiple services as well. So I basically use these three slides to m create some awareness around the impact of using teams in an organization. Yeah, makes sense. And it's more and more the way forward. We can see customers more and more driving it from Teams and then going to a. Uh, so we'll we'll finish off with the customer experience at Inspark. What what usually because we talked we didn't talk about dynamic membership that much, but I see that it's something that's growing in interest. Yeah. So uh, one an, an option you have for Microsoft 365 group is that you can enable a what they call dynamic membership, and that basically means that by creating a rule people are being added or removed to the Microsoft 365 group 
so the team. And that's very interesting for teams that, that are have a lot of people in it that have that are leaving and coming. Because what will happen is that otherwise the owner needs to be no, okay, this person is leaving. I remove him or her. Oh, this person is new. I'll add him or her. By with by setting it by using dynamic membership, you can create a rule. For example, uh, every person that has IT as department will be automatically deleted, uh, added to this team. Let's say that person goes from IT to HR, he or she will be automatically removed. Uh, so this is something that is gaining interest from customers because it, it makes it a little bit easier to manage, especially for the larger uh, uh, permanent teams. Um, and again, the groups thing, it's, it, it, the customers still have a kind of a hard time understanding. Uh, the advantage is, is that the word Microsoft 365 group is kind of like disappearing for business users. They don't see it that much, uh, but it will pop up. They will read it somewhere. They will see it. IT will talk about it. So uh, that's why I try to help them with those infographics and, and, yeah. and often show some demos as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, the last one is SharePoint has been around longer than Teams. So SharePoint always had its, had its own permission model. That was always, it wasn't difficult, but it was also not really that easy. And by connecting that SharePoint part to a team with a group, it's became, it become even more complicated because uh, I think you said it as well. When you add people to a team, they automatically get access to the SharePoint site. But in theory, you can change the permissions of the SharePoint site as well. Now, that part is very complex and, and still difficult to understand. I think I, I think I wrote a blog about it for Sherry maybe five years ago, but I think it's still very relevant. I think it's about uh, this whole aspect of, of working with permissions. Um, yeah, so that, that this is this is a, still a very difficult one. Um, I don't think we can change much about it because it's just the way it is. I think Microsoft is doing a lot of effort in making it more, understanding it more, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's there's still a lot and I wish we could talk about for uh, another hour or two, especially uh, always have fun with Jasper um, and, 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 and seeing what customers are doing. That's uh, getting close to the end, or if not the end for today, uh, we'll talk about the, the recommendations and the slides will be available. Um, I'm going to continue to look at the questions and try to answer them uh, quickly here. But I wanted to thank you, Jasper, for, for joining. I'll also be going on uh, Twitter. Usually what we do uh, and oftentimes is we kind of recap the questions when we publish the blog with the uh, or the blog or whatever with the content, if you will, of this um, of this session. And we try to make sure that we re answer the questions and make them available for everyone later on. So. Uh, if you ask a question and we didn't answer it, I'll try and get into it and, and answer it somewhere, whether it's Twitter. So make sure to follow uh, us either on Twitter, ShareGate, as well as um, you will receive an email shortly with the recording and everything to access it. Um, Jasper, I'll let you with the last uh, last words. Yeah, it's <laughs> the final words. Yeah, so thanks for having me. I had a great time. It's always fun to talk about this topic. Um, yeah, and I hope everybody found it useful who was listening in. And again, just leave any questions you have, and and uh, yeah, I'll, maybe I will help as well at answering them. Uh, and then you can always reach out to me on Twitter as well. Take uh, just the details are here, <laughs> the slide. So don't hesitate <laughs> to reach out. And then uh, hopefully we yeah we see each other in the future in, uh, in person. Would be nice. Thank you very much. If you Thank guys you. have time or you manage Microsoft Teams, we have a quick. Uh, kind of curious survey that we're 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 putting together. So if ever you have time, otherwise, thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon and evening, wherever you are, or morning perhaps. Um, and cheers. <laughs>